Hi everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna be talking about CARS strategy specifically. Now, normally in these videos, I would start off first with a list of recommended flashcard decks and then a list of high yield topics that are covered in this section. CARS is a little bit of an exception. You can't really make flashcard decks for CARS and there aren't really any high yield topics in CARS. You should know that about 50% of CARS passages are science related and 50% are more humanities related, but there are no specific topics that are high yield in terms of CARS. So we'll skip then to specific strategies that you can use to be successful on the CARS section. CARS is really hard to learn and it's really hard to teach because a huge portion of CARS is just being able to read well, comprehend those readings, and analyze those readings. It takes a lot of skill to be able to deduce the author's purpose and the intent, and my best suggestion on improving your performance on CARS is daily practice. I've mentioned previously in this course that Jack Weston is a great resource for daily CARS practice, but use your CARS textbook as well, and do a little bit of CARS work every single day. That'll help you get used to the difficulty of the passages, the difficulty of the questions that are asked about the passages, and it'll help improve your ability to make some of those deductions about the passage. I also mentioned earlier in the course that Exam Crackers is a test prep company that puts out a really good CARS textbook. Specifically, it's called Exam Crackers MCAT Reasoning Skills, and I recommend you check eBay or Amazon for a copy of that book. That was the best resource that I found to improve my CARS performance. Let's move on to strategy. You should read and attempt every passage passage and every question in order. Some test prep companies tell you to modify the order of the passages that you attack based on how difficult you perceive them to be. That'll take up time in your section. I recommend you just do them chronologically. When you're reading through the passage, read deeply enough so that you'll only have to read the passage once. This is important because the number one time consuming part of doing cars is the reading. It's still okay to refer back to the passage to detect specific wording and specific phrases, but you shouldn't be reading entire passages over and over again. It's also important to remember that even average speed readers will be able to do all of the reading in the CARS section and still have two-thirds of the section left to answer questions. So you shouldn't worry too much about your reading speed. You should worry about your reading depth and your ability to comprehend the reading. One of the first things I suggest doing before starting each passage is looking at the source. This might clue you in as to the context surrounding the passage and could help you with some of those deductions about what the author's intent is. Your main goal Goal for these cars passages should be to understand the author and what they're trying to convey. If they're talking about a specific issue, think about which side of the issue they stand on and what they're trying to convince you of. Pay close attention to the main point of the essay or the article. Focus less on the specific details like names and dates. Put yourself in the author's shoes. Imagine you are arguing the same thing as the author. And while you should ignore some of those details like names and dates, you should pay close attention to word choice. Some of those transition words and words that have a hint of rhetoric in them can help you to to deduce what the author is trying to convince you of. A lot of words can have tiny little nuanced meanings that can convey a specific stance on the issue. Also, pay close attention to the questions and the question stems. Often the questions will give you just as much information as the passage, so nuanced words in the question stems may also help to point to a specific answer choice. The most difficult questions on cars are the ones that are asking you to take the knowledge from the passage and apply it in an entirely new way. You're essentially taking your deductions about what the author's intent is and applying it to a different context. Again, with these types of questions, it'll help to put yourself in the author's shoes and apply that perspective to a new context. In this new context, how might you argue? What decision would you make? And internalizing that author's intent might help you to answer some of those tougher cars questions. One of the things that people are worried about about with cars is timing. But like I said, even an average speed reader will be able to complete the cars readings with plenty of time to spare. So don't get anxious about how slow or how quickly you're reading your passage. Focus on your comprehension. Now, if you do a couple of practice exams and you're still not finishing cars, then it may be time to reevaluate and do a lot of practice to up that speed. But overall, speed shouldn't be something that you're worried about when you first start practicing cars. Okay, let's delve into this cars passage from the MCAT sample question guide. So first I'm gonna check the source. The source says G. Hardin, The Tragedy of the Commons. Copyright 1968 by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So we know this isn't a scientific journal, but we don't know what type of science it is. The clues that we can get are that it's published in 1968, and that the topic will be on the tragedy of the commons, 
So we're already primed to begin this article. The passage starts out talking about the wealth of nations. This is a pretty well-known text, and this is a case where background knowledge might actually help you answer some of these questions. But it is good to remember that Cars doesn't expect you to have any prior knowledge of the material at hand. The first paragraph is talking about how the wealth of nations popularized the invisible hand. The idea that an individual who intends only personal gain is led by an invisible hand to promote the public interest. Adam Smith did not assert that this principle was invariably true, but it contributed to a tendency of thought that has since remained dominant. The assumption that decisions reached individually will collectively be the best decisions for society as a whole. So this seems like important information. It's talking about a specific assumption. That might be a sentence that I highlight. It then says, if this assumption is correct, it justifies the continuance of the US policy of laissez-faire in many issues affecting business, the environment, and the family. If it is not correct, U.S. citizens need to re-examine their individual freedoms to see which are defensible. Now, so far, this passage has really only given us information, and it seems like the author is relatively neutral up to this point in the article. The passage goes on to say, The rebuttal to the invisible hand theory could be called the tragedy of the commons. Picture a pasture open to all. It can be expected that each herder will try to keep as many cattle as possible. Such an arrangement may work reasonably well for centuries because tribal wars, poaching, and disease keep the numbers of both human and beast far below the carrying capacity. Finally, however, comes the day of reckoning, that is, the day on which the long-desired goal of social stability becomes a reality. At this point, the inherent logic of the commons remorselessly generates tragedy. So that word tragedy is one of the first indications that the author might be against this idea. Overall, this paragraph is a counterpoint to the first paragraph, and other than that word tragedy, we don't really have any other clues on where the author stands. As a rational being, each herder seeks to maximize personal gain. More or less consciously, the individual asks, what is the utility of adding one more animal? Since the herder would receive all the proceeds from the sale of this animal, the positive component is nearly plus one. The negative component is a function of the overgrazing caused by an additional animal. Since the effects of this overgrazing are shared by all the herders, the negative utility is some fraction of negative one. So in this hypothetical, the author is saying that the herder can gain all personal benefit from the additional of another animal, but the negative benefit of the overgrazing is shared by the whole. Adding the component utilities, the rational herder concludes that the only sensible course is to add another animal and another and another. This conclusion is reached by every rational herder who shares the commons. All are locked into a system that compels each to increase his or her gain without limit in a world that is limited. Ruin is the destination toward which all rush, each pursuing the right to use a public resource. We see that word ruin, which also signals that this author feels negatively about this concept. The problem is that a commons, if justifiable at all, is justifiable only under conditions of low population density. As the human population has increased, the commons concept has had to be abandoned in one aspect after another. So that last sentence tells us that the author feels that this invisible hand concept can only be justifiable under conditions of low population density, and that in the current state of humanity, we have to abandon that concept. The social arrangements that would produce responsibility in this scenario create coercion. Coercion in that case seems like it has a negative connotation. The only kind of coercion I recommend is mutual coercion. We see that term I recommend, so the author is bringing in their personal opinion at this point. The only kind of coercion I recommend is mutual coercion, agreed to by a majority of those affected. Compulsory taxes are acceptable because a system of voluntary contributions would favor the consciousness. So, in this case, the author is arguing that those compulsory taxes are a form of coercion, but are acceptable because this system favors the consciousness. A society institutes and grumblingly, there's another word that can indicate intent, supports taxes and other coercive devices to escape the horror of the commons. There's another word with negative connotation, the horror. Every new enclosure of the commons involves the infringement of somebody's personal freedom. But what does freedom mean? Those subject to the logic of the commons are free only to bring on universal ruin. Once they acknowledge the logic of mutual coercion, they become free to pursue other goals. We must now recognize the necessity of abandoning the commons assumption in our reproduction. That sentence makes definitively clear the author's intent. Failure to do so will bring ruin on us all. Let's head to the questions. 
Question one says, according to the passage, the decisive factor in determining whether someone's actions should be subject to coercion is whether the actions blank. Answer choice A says, are determined solely by self-interest. Now you should ask yourself, is the author arguing that all actions determined by self-interest should be subject to coercion. It seems a little bit extreme, right? A decision I make about an interpersonal relationship or an interaction I have with another individual, for example, may affect me and that other individual, but they might not affect everyone. The author also explicitly argues against coercion, except coercion agreed to by a majority of those affected. And so choice B says whether the actions affect collectively held resources. This makes more sense than the first one, because if we narrow our scope to personal actions that affect commonly held resources, it seems like the author might be more likely to agree to coercion in this case if the majority of those affected agree. Answer choice C says degrade the natural environment. I think that's too narrow of a scope because there are personal decisions that can be made that affect everyone, but that don't specifically degrade the natural environment. Economic decisions, for example. D says are commonly considered immoral. There's not a lot of talk about morality in this passage. It's more just about economic philosophy. The author doesn't really make any arguments based off of morality more just economic philosophy. So B is our best answer here. Question two says the passage argument suggests that national parks might benefit from. This is a case where you wanna put yourself in the author's shoes and then extrapolate that opinion of the author into a new context. So you're gonna pick the Roman numeral that appears exactly twice. It looks like all Roman numerals appear exactly twice, so we'll just start at Roman numeral one. Roman numeral one says the restriction of recreational use by means of fees. If you think back to the passage, this could be an example of that coercion. The author argues that coercion is good if it is agreed upon by the majority of those affected, and if it ultimately benefits society as a whole. The restriction of this recreational use by means of fees would prevent individuals from taking advantage from the commonly shared resources and would allow society to jointly share those commonly shared resources. So we like Roman numeral number one. That means we can get rid of answer choices B and D. So now we'll analyze Roman numeral two. Roman numeral two says the selling of the facilities to private investors. For much of the passage, the author argues that individuals working in their own self-interest will eventually bring ruin upon society especially in a case where there is high population density, which the author says has occurred already. The author also doesn't mention private investors specifically or privately owned resources, just resources that are commonly held between everyone in a society and how individual decisions affect those commonly shared resources. So Roman numeral two doesn't make much sense for us. That means our answer is A. Now you don't even have to analyze Roman numeral three, but let's. Three says the opening of additional facilities to the public. Would the creation of more publicly held resources do anything to stop the tragedy of the commons? No, it wouldn't. For example, if we had a larger pasture, that would only delay the inevitable in the example that the author gave earlier. Eventually, individuals would take advantage of those commonly shared resources and that larger shared resource and would do nothing to stop the tragedy of the commons. So three does not apply. Let's go on to question three. Question three says some communities with expanding populations have four centuries successfully managed commonly held land. An appropriate clarification of the passage would be the stipulation that the author's argument applies only to blank. A wouldn't make much sense because the question stem indicates that communities have been doing this in the present and in the past. Answer choice B says unregulated resources, and that sounds more like what the author is arguing in the passage, that we should institute coercion that is agreed upon by the majority of those affected on the resources that are unregulated. C says conditions of social instability, but the author never argues that social instability is necessary. The author argues that with commonly shared resources, where all people are working to their own personal interest, there will reach a point where those commonly shared resources resources are ruined, no matter of the stability or instability of the social structure. Answer choice D says resources that are not managed locally. That doesn't really have anything to do with the author's argument. Nowhere in the passage does it mention that this only applies to resources that are local. So hopefully walking through some of my strategies for cars and walking through this cars passage with you will help improve your strategy as you are reading these cars passages and attacking the questions for the cars passages. Thanks so much for joining me in this video. In the next video, we're going to be talking about specific strategies for the bio section. See you next time.